Among French medievalists, there was a phrase, la grande mutation, the great change, which, they argue, characterized a revolution which swept across the medieval world in the 10th and the 11th centuries. Now, not every medieval historian accepts the validity of this idea. Certainly, there were changes to basically all of medieval society across probably most of Europe, minus perhaps Russia and the parts of Europe which connect to the Eurasian steppe, which have its own nomadic influences, but certainly in what we today consider everything to the north, south, and west of the former Iron Curtain. So everything from social structures to political structures to economic structures to architecture to philosophy and other um, aspects of intellectual history to the measurement of time to diet to farming to sex, the list is pretty much endless, had changed significantly by about the start of 1100 from where it all lay at the start of about 900, 850 maybe. But was this really a revolution? Many historians of this time period would deny this, and they would argue for a more drawn-out interpretation, a long durée, a long duration understanding of these changes. So really, to understand all of this, we have to ground ourselves somewhere, at some point in time. So what we'll do then is we're going to start with what medievalists refer to as the time of troubles, and then move through the 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries, and come to grips with this so-called great change. And we begin with the fall of the Carolingian Empire. But what I want to do here, both as an introduction and as a standalone video, is talk about the breakup of the Carolingian Empire, because it sets the stage for everything else, and also talk about Lotharingia, the ghost kingdom, the shadow kingdom, the shadow realm, uh, the phantom state. You're going to see it written and referred to in different ways, depending on what language you read, depending on what books and articles you pick up, but it all kind of means the same thing. This sort of shadowy entity which existed, but at the same time, like, not really in the early medieval period, and which dictated the fate of Europe, according to one argument, um, for about a thousand years. Now, you don't necessarily have to buy this argument, you don't have to agree with it, but it exists, and it deals heavily with this period of the Middle Ages, and early modern Europe, and World War I, and two, and the creation of the European Union, again, according to one line of argument. So I figured we should probably talk about it at some point on the channel, because it does, or can, color how we view European history. Clifford Backman, a professor of medieval studies at Boston University, in his book The Worlds of Medieval Europe, writes that the Carolingian world collapsed spectacularly. And yeah, that's certainly an apt way of characterizing it, in some ways, it's probably a bit of an understatement. Carolingian succession, more or less, was structured so that each son got a portion of the kingdom, or the property in general. So you have three sons, and the kingdom is split into thirds when dad dies. And for quite a while, the Carolingians basically just had pure dumb luck in that a single male heir was produced who had the same goal as his predecessor, hold the thing together expand the empire, and continue spreading Christianity. This is more or less the legacy of Charlemagne, the creation of an idea that we today call Europe, something which incorporates the Roman Empire but also expands past the Rhine, past the Danube frontier, into Central Europe, into Scandinavia, north into Scotland. Wherever Christianity goes, this is his legacy. Now, the son of Charlemagne, Louis the Pious, he did the best he could, and arguably, under him, the empire reached its zenith between 813 and about 840 when he's ruling, but a major issue was not only that he lacked Charlemagne's talents for governing, he also didn't inspire the same level of command or respect or fear that his father did. Now, this is not to say that he wasn't imposing. He was. It just wasn't to the same degree that Charlemagne was. In the aftermath of the Western Roman Empire's demise, around about 500, the manner in which power was legitimated totally changed. It used to be that power and prestige were given by the Roman Emperor 
and that having his backing meant that you were secure in your rule, your institution, or whatever. This was the patron-client network which governed many aspects of the social relations and the political relations of the Roman state. So, this is, or was, a major reason why early Frankish kings like Clovis looked to Constantinople for legitimacy and why they took titles like consul or patrician. These were Roman titles, which had Roman authority in the immediate context of the post-Roman West, 6th century, 7th century, but once the empire is no longer around, power gradually begins to be legitimated through what the medievalist Chris Wickham calls the authority of the visual. This is not exactly that complex of a topic. Essentially, most people can't read, or at least can't read well, so the bestowing of authority has less to do with written contracts or some other document, and more to do with the handing out of weapons, giving people clods of soil, which symbolize maybe the bequeathment of land, maybe being blessed by a priest or a bishop in the middle of a mass in front of all your subjects, etc. It's all visual, and going along with the visual aspect, a lot of it is spiritual. The church has a big role to play here. And in the early Middle Ages, part of that visuality was handing out booty, which went along with another way power was legitimated. You had God's support, and thus the support of the church because your territory expanded successfully to bring Christianity to new areas. So what you basically have is support by right of conquest. Well, under Louis, the Carolingians really stopped expanding. He was not a bad general. He was actually pretty successful, and he led multiple armies under Charlemagne's rule to victory. But Louis' rule was a bit more peaceful or at least it tried to be peaceful. So under Louis, the Carolingians stop expanding, so what he lacks then is the loot and the booty to hand out to his followers. The Carolingians might have had notions of being the new Roman Empire, and the Pope might back them, but the loyalty of their followers still had to be bought. There wasn't necessarily an idea of what we would basically understand to be like state loyalty, imperial loyalty, patriotism. You are loyal to the state simply because you have that developed in you through the course of your life. Like, for example, as an American, I would consider myself to be loyal to the Constitution and to the overall ideals and laws of the U.S. That doesn't necessarily exist in this time period. You are loyal to the king because you get something out of it. So this was still very much a warlike tribalized society in many ways, but Louis did realize that the practice of dividing up Frankish territory, only for it to be reunited again through war, could possibly weaken the state long term. Yes, the Carolingians had got lucky, because they've only had one son for a couple of generations, but what if you have four or five generations with multiple sons? It doesn't necessarily bode well for the empire, does it? So what he tried to do was issue laws of primogeniture, inheritance to the firstborn, or to the eldest male. But because he doesn't have the strong support of his followers, and because of the specifications for how all of that would actually work, younger sons were, understandably, well, let's call it what it was, they were pissed. So there were multiple revolts, including revolts by Louis's younger sons. And in 822, he had to do public penance to atone for the supposed evil he had done, which we'll come back to in a minute. And in 832, he was actually deposed briefly and imprisoned. Now, he did manage to return briefly to power, but the last years of his reign were characterized by pretty heavy infighting and by politicking behind the scenes. So when he died, the Carolingian Empire was broken up into three different territories. Lothar became king of Middle Francia, Louis the German became king of East Francia, what is today basically Germany and Austria, while Charles the Bald became king of West Francia, essentially modern France, or at least most of it. Now the three, as you might expect, fought to reunify the Carolingian Empire. So with that said, let's dig a little deeper with this now because it's really important for framing what happens next and for framing the whole idea of Lotharingia as a concept in European historiography. So, Louis was a king who appears to have meant well, and this can be inferred from his nickname, the Pious. Compared with his kids, Charles the Bald, Louis the German, and with his grandson, Louis the Stammerer, but who, as we've already covered a bit, was in some ways a bit inept. Charlemagne did leave awfully big shoes, and Louis couldn't quite fill them. 
It's under Louis that the Viking Age really begins. The first attack, or at least the first well-known attack, was on the monastery of Lindisfarne in 793, and documents start to mention more and more and more attacks by the Vikings, which quickly evolve from these small, um, isolated hit-and-run raids on these isolated tiny monasteries like Lindisfarne to what we would more or less consider actual invasions, and there wasn't really an effective response to this. So that's something that's going on, and it kind of forms a backdrop to all of this, and it's exacerbated by the actions of Louis' sons. We've already mentioned the attempt by Louis to instate primogeniture and to try and keep Frankish lands together, at least to some extent, and that this did fail. Now, it was exacerbated by his sons because he had sons by two different wives. So not only is the problem, well, what do you do with the younger sons? It's also, which eldest son is actually the eldest, and then what do you do with the other one? But he tried to alter how the empire was structured, and he did this to try and hold it together, but also because he appears to have had a very specific conception of what the Carolingian Empire actually was, beyond what Charlemagne and other kings actually thought the empire should be. Louis believed very, very strongly that as emperor, he ruled over a holy state, much like the late Roman Empire had an ideology based around a divine role in human affairs with the backing of God. The Roman Empire existed because it was part of Jesus Christ's plan for humanity. As a holy emperor, Louis the Pious was both a secular and a religious leader. The problem with this, though, is that at some point the boundaries become muddled, and when they start to get muddled, they become pretty gray pretty quickly. If emperorship was a secular as well as a religious office, well, does that mean that secular institutions have authority over the religious, or is it the other way around? Now, remember what I said earlier about power being legitimated through visual means. The Pope crowning the Emperor, or Bishop supporting the Emperor in their Mass on Sunday, are examples of these things. So, does that give religious leaders more power? Is it okay for the Pope or Bishops to intervene with the King if he's doing something they don't like? Because of this, Louis performed public penance twice. The first was at a place called Attigny in 822, where his bishops and the Pope, Pascal I, held the Council of Attigny. Louis showed up basically wearing um, rags, basically like burlap would be the modern-day equivalent, and he's there to do penance and seek forgiveness for the torture of his brothers and for his cruelty toward his nephew Bernard. So Bernard was the king of Italy and was at one point in the succession, but he's removed. And he rebels, because he was removed, and he was captured by Louis' forces. Now, he wasn't supposed to be executed. Instead, Bernard was supposed to be blinded, and so made unfit to rule. This was very popular in the Byzantine Empire, and maybe it was thought by Louis that maybe, you know, this was more merciful, since you can't see, but hey, you get to keep your life. Well, the blinding was screwed up. The way you were blinded in these times was by taking a stiletto dagger, heating it up so it glowed, and then gouging out the eyes. Except this time, it failed, and the wounds became infected, and Bernard was in excruciating pain for about two days before he finally expired. So Louis had to do penance for what we would probably consider today to be a cruel and unusual punishment, or at least a punishment which became cruel and unusual because somebody screwed up. But doing this penance lost in prestige and it increased the power of the church, because it made it seem like religious authority had more weight to it. Nevertheless, Louis still held on to these ideas he had about the Empire, and he essentially divides up the Empire in theory to give Lothar, his eldest, the Heartlands, and in theory, most of the power because he controls the old Frankish Heartlands, the Rhine, and that gives him like historical legitimacy, historical backing, it gives him precedent. This is basically the idea. His brothers Louis and Pippin and his cousin Bernard were allotted smaller territories, which is why Bernard rebelled. He was technically supposed to be a vassal to Lothar, but he died, so now he's out of the running. Pippin dies as well, so now it's just Louis and Lothar. So where does Charles the Bald come from? Well, I mentioned a moment ago that Louis the Pious had children from two different marriages. This is where Charles comes into play. He was the son of the second marriage, and his mother, Judith of Bavaria, pressured Louis to make him an heir of some kind. Now, this enraged the other sons because they were getting less out of their inheritance, and it led to multiple rebellions. 
the removal of support from the church, the fall from power of Louis in 832, and when he returned in 834, he was basically ineffective. So Lothar and Louis and Charles fought what can be viewed as a three-pronged civil war. In 842, Louis and Charles formed an alliance against Lothar and they defeated him, resulting in the Treaty of Verdun. Now, this treaty formally divided the Carolingian Empire into three separate kingdoms, which we briefly talked about already. West Francia, Middle Francia, and East Francia. The alliance which Louis and Charles formed against Lothar is called the Oath of Strasbourg, and it's the first document we have surviving which was explicitly written in Romance. That is, one of the languages descended from Latin. In this case, what eventually becomes French. Louis the German swore this oath in Romance, while Charles the Bald swore it in Frankish so that each other's troops could understand it. Now, what's important here is that this reflects, in part, due to the impact of the Roman Empire, a linguistic divide that was taking shape which would solidify along the borders of Western and Eastern Francia, what become the kingdoms of France and Germany. The middle portion, though, Middle Francia, was broken up when Lothar was dying into three portions for his three sons. Louis II, his eldest, became king of Italy, Charles became king of Provence, and Lothar II was granted the rest, what became known by the 10th century as the Kingdom of Lothar, Lotharingia. In German, this territory is known as Lotharingen, but in France, it's known as Lorraine. Those of you who know your European history know the significance of this region, especially in the 19th century. Now, probably the simplest way to describe what Lotharingia was is to say that it was the territory between the Rhine and the Meuse rivers, and which extends north to south from the North Sea, deep into what is today Switzerland. In the late Roman period, the borderlands of the Roman Empire were zones of cultural and linguistic mixing. To serve on the army of the Rhine, you would have had to know Frankish. To serve on the Danube, you would have to know Gothic, because the soldiers were often Frankish and were often Gothic. But as the 4th and 5th centuries progressed, it would not have been unusual for Roman landowners to hire Frankish laborers, or maybe to hire Frankish bodyguards or Frankish thugs to protect their estates, and it would not have been unusual for people who spoke Frankish to move into the empire, who would reach out to family across the Rhine and bring them over. Of course, we also have the more famous invasions, but my point is that there were many forms of push and pull factors which brought people over the border. So the linguistic zone gets wider and it becomes more mixed, and this lasts up until the present. If you look at Lotharingia on a map, it contains the modern countries of Switzerland, most of Belgium, most of the Netherlands, Luxembourg, parts of France, parts of Germany. These are areas which don't have a single language. Switzerland has at least four, Belgium has two, and there have been problems over the course of Belgium's history resulting from the tensions between these two languages and in some ways between two cultures. So it's not along borders, it's along the entire region. Now this area, both at the time and now, is extremely wealthy. The purpose of the Treaty of Prum, which created Lotharingia in 855, when Lothar I died and broke it up among his sons, was to divide resources. This was also the purpose of the Treaty of Verdun. Everyone gets a slice of the Frankish heartlands. Now, during the Carolingian period, one of the seats of economic power was the port of Dorstad, and although it declined due to Viking raids, it remained a major trading center. Its decline, however, led to the rise of trading emporiums all along the Meuse River and to the growth of trading centers around the cities of Verdun and Metz, and which became a center of the early medieval slave trade. So the list here is pretty much endless in terms of economic benefits and economic prosperity of this region. All along the Rhine, as another example, eventually what spring up are towers and castles, designed in part to extract tolls from merchants who are bringing their ships along that river. And all throughout Lotharingia, in the 10th century, what you really start to find are heavy concentrations of that most medieval of structures, the castle. Also concentrated in this territory were eight bishoprics, two archbishoprics, and dozens of imperial monasteries, which, due to the shift in power to visual and spiritual um, legitimation, granted boosts to imperial authority. So when Lothar II died in 869, his uncles, Charles and Louis, went to war over the area again for all of the aforementioned regions. 
and the result was the 870 Treaty of Mearson, which split Lotharingia down the middle. And when Louis died in 876, Charles attempted to wrest the whole of Lotharingia from East Francia, but he was defeated by his nephew Louis the Younger. And four years later, after some dynastic chaos, the resulting Treaty of Ribemont ceded all of Lotharingia to East Francia. But the two kingdoms, East and West Francia, still saw it as a region which required dual rule and dual responsibility. Now, between 875 and 884, so about nine years, eight Carolingian heirs die in rapid succession, and the crown then passes to Charles the Fat, who reunited most of the Frankish lands, essentially by default because he was like the only guy left. When he dies in 888, he has no male heirs, so the Carolingian Empire breaks up for good. Now, one of the ways you can view the history of Europe, which is the view that we're exploring in this video, is, well, the Roman Empire dissolved. How do you put it back together again? And in big picture terms, what was the Roman Empire? It represented a zone of peace and prosperity which allowed for economic flourishing. So, how do you do that again? The Carolingian Empire was an attempt, so how do you put the Carolingian Empire back together again? The aristocrats who asserted themselves after the breakup of the Carolingian Empire had no sort of blood relations to one another. They had some blood relations, at least a few of them did, to the Carolingian line, but as distant cousins, which was fatal for any attempt at imperial resurgence. Now at the Battle of Leuven in 891, Arnulf, the Duke of Carinthia, which was a territory located in most of modern Austria and a bit of modern-day Slovenia, he defeated an army of Vikings, and following his victory, he built a castle on the Dial River in Lotharingia. Now, through doing this, he was able to cement his rule over East Francia, what was gradually becoming the Kingdom of Germany, and what would eventually become the territory, or at least part of the territory, of the Holy Roman Empire. And he was interested in those things, which meant that his focus, although ruling East Francia, was on Italy and on papal politics. But there was chaos on his western frontier, so to stabilize things, he attempted to brush aside local power players and put his son, Zventibald, on the throne of Lotharingia. Now, he succeeded in doing this, and Zventibald is the only person besides Lothar II to rule Lotharingia as an actual kingdom and as an actual king. But he was killed in 900, and the man who took over, Louis, died at 18, and he died without an heir. Now, there had been some connection to the Carolingians through Arnulf and through this last ruler, Louis the Childless, but with Louis's death, any last remnants of a family who could claim enough imperial blood to assert themselves as a Carolingian ruler were basically gone. So, throughout the 900s then, the Lotharingians, as they become known in sources from the 10th century, actively transferred allegiance from East Francia to Western Francia and back to East, back to West, over and over again. Eventually, in 925, as a result of marriage alliances, Lotharingia would be attached to East Francia, and it would stay there for another 700 years. Not, however, that the West Franks, or the French as they were becoming known, took this lying down. For the remainder of the 10th and the 11th centuries, attempting to win control of Lotharingia was arguably the central feature of French politics. In 936, there was a rebellion against Otto I, Holy Roman Emperor, and Louis IV, the King of France, invaded Lotharingia. And although he was defeated, he did marry the sister of the former magnate of Lotharingia, and named the resulting son Lothar. So you kind of see where he's trying to go with all of this. So in 953, there was a second rebellion centered on the region, and so the conflicts continue right until 986, when Lothar and his son, Louis V, die. They were succeeded by the Capetian dynasty as the new rulers of France. Now this largely stops the back and forth fighting because the Capetian dynasty sort of renounces their interest in this area, but like not really, as we're going to see. Now there is one strain of historical thought which has seen this fighting as a dispute between East and West Francia for control of the middle as evolving into a dispute between France and Germany for control of the region. This view is, at one and the same time, both totally correct and 
totally incorrect. It depends how you look at it, it depends what you stress. In the medieval period, it was the result of a breakdown of Carolingian authority. The centrality of the region to the fighting between East and West Francia is what stamped it on the face of Europe. And yet, from another perspective, it really does go deeper than just this. Throughout the Middle Ages, and most of the early modern period, in fact, all of the early modern period, Lorraine and what eventually becomes the Low Countries, the Benelux, provided spouses for numerous royal marriages. The ports become centers of trade, the universities become centers of learning, and their flat open lands become the battlegrounds of empires. So this is an area which, for geopolitical reasons, for economic reasons, for intellectual reasons, you want to either control outright or you want to have like a sphere of influence in this area. So in 953, the Holy Roman Emperor Otto I had appointed his brother, Bruno, as Duke of Lotharingia. Now Bruno divided the territory in two, the Duchy of Lower Lorraine and the Duchy of Upper Lorraine. Lower Lorraine was essentially the modern Benelux plus like the Rhineland and the Saarland. And although it was broken up into about a dozen territories around 1100, it was still one of the divisions. Upper Lorraine comprised the territory surrounding the triangle of land between the three cities of Trier, Metz, and Verdun, and extending a little bit more south towards Switzerland. During the 12th and the 13th centuries, it was arguably one of the economic hearts of the Holy Roman Empire, and eventually, a portion of this becomes the Duchy of the Moselle, and it comes into the possession of René of Anjou, Duke of Anjou and King of Naples, though he only lives there after he was deposed as king, um, and it's under René that this territory again starts to become known as Lotharingia. At this time, so the mid-1400s, roughly 1430s, 40s, a series of smaller territories had broken off from the duchy. The duchy of Luxembourg, the duchy, well, originally it's a county, um, of Bar, the electorate of Trier, which becomes one of the territories which has the power to cast a vote to elect the Holy Roman Emperor, and the three bishoprics of Verdun, Metz, and Toul. Now, back up a little bit. In 1361, Philip, the Duke of Burgundy, died. Now, I don't want to get too bogged down in genealogy, but what I want you to recall from earlier is that the treaties which broke up the Carolingian Empire essentially established Burgundy as its own territory. This is in the southeast of France, near the modern-day Italian border. So, in 1361, that territory was reincorporated into the Kingdom of France because there was no heir. And three years later, in 1364, John II of the Valois dynasty, who was king of France, gave it to one of his sons, one of his younger sons, Philip Valois, known as Philip the Bold. And Philip, as Duke of Burgundy, established a cadet branch of the royal dynasty of France, known as the House of Valois Burgundy. This is right at the start of the Hundred Years' War between England and France, and the English king, Edward III, had a son, Edmund, who was engaged to Margaret of Flanders, who was designated as heir to a couple different territories, the counties of Flanders, Artois, Nevers, and Rithel, and the free county of Burgundy. This was a separate territory from the duchy, um, which happened to share the name. Now, John died in 1364, and he was succeeded by his son Charles, and Charles could not allow this marriage to happen. France was at war with England, and if Edmund and Margaret were married, well, that might potentially bring her territories, what was basically the former duchy of um, Lower Lorraine, into the war against France. Instead, Charles wants to marry Margaret to his brother Philip, the new Duke of Burgundy, and thereby keep the territories in good standing with France. Well, that ends up happening, and the long and short of it all is that when Margaret's father dies, she brings her territories into a union with Philip's, creating what historians have called the Burgundian state. Now, not everybody agrees with this idea. Not everybody agrees that this was a thing. People at the time certainly didn't recognize anything of the sorts. Um, indeed, the whole conception of the Burgundian state was a personal union centered on the House of Valois Burgundy. But there are hints that the idea of a Burgundian state as a political idea was taking hold in the minds of some despite the fact that the House of Valois Burgundy, due to the various titles, were vassals both to the French king and to the Holy Roman Emperor. So again, we go back to this whole theme of what do you do with this slice of territory between France and Germany. 
Now, everybody watching this video, assuming you've actually made it this far and haven't been bored by, you know, medieval European politics, um, I would assume know of the famous English longbow. A whole bunch of channels have done videos on this, and I would assume you also know of the famous Battle of Agincourt in 1415, when Henry V's army managed to defeat a larger French force, and the arrows fell like rain and slaughtered French knights. Now, the French very quickly find themselves in a bad position, and in large part, it's because the House of Valois Burgundy and the House of Orleans were both heirs to the French throne, and John the Fearless of Burgundy basically was the power behind the throne because King Charles VI was mad, he was insane, um, and the House of Orleans jockeyed with them for power. And eventually, John had Louis of Orleans murdered in broad daylight in the middle of Paris. Now this triggered a civil war, which the English got involved in, so the French were fighting at basically like half strength. But John was murdered in turn in 1419 during peace negotiations, or attempted peace negotiations, between the two branches of the civil war. Now John's son Philip, for obvious reasons, was angry and he sought revenge so he decides to cast his lot in with the English, and the very thing the French didn't want to happen, happened. The entire eastern portion of their territory was at war with the state. Most of the former territory of Lotharingia was at war with West Francia. Fast forward to 1435, and the Burgundians are trying to get out of the war, which they managed to do with the Congress of Arras, which saw Philip the Good, the new Duke of Burgundy, recognize Charles VII of France's right to the throne, and Charles recognized Burgundian lands, and the dukes did not have to pay homage to the French kings. So, what was this now? Was this an independent state? Well, it was certainly starting to look like that. So, between 1435 and 1467, Philip aggressively expanded his holdings through marriage alliances, people dying, and Philip being the person in line for the inheritance, um, and in one instance actually just buying the territory outright because his own territory was wealthy and the other guy was broke. So Philip's own territories of Burgundy gained the county of Namur, the Margraviate of Antwerp, the duchies of Brabant, Limburg, and Luxembourg, the counties of Hainault, Holland, Zealand, and this led to the creation of a new territory, the Burgundian Netherlands, which we'll come back to very soon. Now, the coast of this territory was extremely wealthy, and its citizens made a living on trade. There was this joke in the 18th century which basically said that where you find money, you'll find a Dutchman, and this has some basis in reality. But because of the centralization that Philip was attempting to do, after all his territories were pretty far flung at this point, many of the towns and cities in this area, in the uh, Burgundian Netherlands, revolted, partially against taxes, partially because they were going to lose various rights and freedoms which have been granted over the centuries to these towns, and it resulted in the Wars of Liege. There were three of them, and they were defeated three times. But for long-term European history, this stuff is important because this is arguably when you start to see things like a Dutch national identity, a Belgian national identity, start to coalesce in the form that we would understand a national identity today. So in 1467, Philip died, and he was succeeded by his son Charles, who becomes known as Charles the Bold. So, more than anything else, Charles the Bold wanted to establish his land as an actual kingdom. And in 1469, two years after he comes to power, Duke Sigismund Habsburg sold his territories in Lorraine to Charles. So, Charles gets various lands added to his holdings, and in return he becomes an ally to Sigismund. And he also conquers several more territories, he gets into a spat with the King of France in 1470, and he declares that Burgundy is officially independent. So, I've talked about this before in various videos, but in the early modern period, there were two main forms of political organization. There were large kingdoms and large duchies like England, like France, like Burgundy, and then there were smaller units like counties and city-states and, you know, small fiefdoms, like knight holdings, that sort of thing, which often formed into leagues. Why does the state develop in the form that it does? That is to say, a nation-state, which are usually large, and usually contiguous. The answer, basically, um, is war. War is one of the most complex things a society can do, and it takes a great deal of money, good transport, 
sometimes a common ideal, but really money, money, and more money. The territory of Charles the Bold was extremely wealthy. That's a point I've stressed over and over about this region that used to be Middle Francia. And Charles used that money to construct a modern army. Now, these were not feudal levies anymore. These were, instead, based on the French model, ordnance companies. So, around the middle of the Hundred Years' War, so let's say between 1380 and about 1420, let's say, the kingdoms of England and France, as well as duchies like Burgundy, relied heavily on mercenaries called free companies. Well, for reasons we won't get into here, um, those free companies got out of control, and they basically like set southern France on fire, pillaging and raiding for years. There is a related argument to this that some of those free companies wander down into Italy and they get hired by the Italian cities as condottieri, mercenaries, which grant the Italian cities the security and the power they need to kickstart the Renaissance. And there is some truth to that, but it's another video. Anyway, the French throne realizes that these free companies are a problem for somewhat obvious reasons, right? You can't collect taxes or tell the people of a territory that they're under your protection when the soldiers kick down the villagers' doors, force themselves upon their daughters, and slay their sons and rob them. So the French government takes a look at what's happening and they say, okay, many of these groups, because the mercenaries are hired by captains. So in 1439, the Estates General passes a series of laws which basically attempts to break the power of the nobility because they make it so that the king is the only one able to raise armies. And this was done through the passage of a special tax, the tally. So these French mercenary captains go out and using the money raised by the tally tax, they start talking to these free companies and they say, look, the French king is building a new army, a royal army, a French army. And he wants you because you're experienced. You join us, or we hunt you down and we kill you. So many of these free companies form the basis of the new French army, the Compagnie d'Ordonnance, the ordnance companies. Each company was based around 100 squads of heavy cavalry, lancers, supported by dismounted infantry, crossbowmen, archers, gunners, and artillery, as well as um, light cavalrymen. Now eventually, by the 1450s, there are support companies made up entirely of archers, entirely of artillery, and these are professional armies, or at least semi-professional armies. The free archers of France were drawn from peasant militias, but it's starting to move in that direction. This is a major reason why the French are able to win the Hundred Years' War. They have a professional standing army, loyal to the state and loyal to the king. Charles the Bold copies this, but he tweaks the system. Yes, he has cavalry. Yes, he has archers. Yes, he has swordsmen. Yes, he has crossbowmen. But what he has in abundance are cannon and guns. Lots and lots of guns. This freaks out the Swiss. At the same time, Sigismund tried to buy his territory back that he had sold Charles, and Charles refuses because he's trying to consolidate his land. So the Swiss and Sigismund form an anti-Burgundian alliance, and they're joined by rebellious cities in the Burgundian Netherlands. And this starts the Burgundian War, which was fought between 1474 and 1477. Charles' problem, however, is that 15th century firearms still weren't advanced enough, so he had to rely on his core units of cavalry, like the French did. So when you deploy these units, yeah, you have squads made up of heavy cavalry supported by light cavalry, supported by an archer, a crossbowman, but on the field, these are broken up into divisions of heavy cavalry, light cavalry, swordsmen, etc. But they're all supporting one another. They're essentially using what we would understand today in modern military um, doctrine to be like mixed unit tactics, but they still have companies on the field of cavalry and swordsmen, etc. There is no squadron where you have a sergeant and a rifleman, and a support gunner, etc., all mixed together. These are broken up. So, why does Charles lose? The answer is that the Swiss develop a new method of fighting to counter the Ordnance Company and the way it's deployed on the field. It's something of a truism in military studies in that no general wants to fight the last war. Well, the Burgundians had fought the last major war, the Hundred Years' War, and they won. So they're using tactics that worked, but they're based on cavalry. So the Swiss developed what's called the Gewalthaufen, the 
crowd force. And we know it as the pike square. So you've got about 100 men, maybe more, armed with pikes at least 10 feet long, sometimes as long as 25 feet. And these had been used throughout the Middle Ages as a defense against cavalry. But what the Swiss do is they make it offensive. They take the pikes to the enemy. So Charles didn't think, in fact nobody really thought, that men with pikes could win unsupported by archers or artillery or guns or cavalry. But they do. Because the enemy can't get near them. And they charge with the pikes. So this leads to Charles's defeat and death on the battlefield outside the city of Nancy in 1477. And this, combined with ordnance companies and the improvement of firearms, the improvement of gunpowder technology, becomes the pike and shot method which dominated early modern warfare and made it so deadly. And with that gets combined with fortification changes to accommodate artillery on walls. Warfare just gets brutal fast. And large territories are the ones which have the money to actually do this, so they win out over these smaller leagues. Now the failure of Charles the Bold to create a new kingdom, possibly a new kingdom of Lotharingia, changed the balance of power in Western and Central Europe, because after the Burgundian War, the War of the Burgundian Succession started because the House of Valois Burgundy basically died out. The next, well it depends on who you ask. Some historians will say the next five, some will say the next 16 years, saw that war, the War of the Burgundian Succession, fought out between the House of Habsburg and the Kingdom of France for control of Burgundian territory. So they're still fighting over this economic and geopolitical zone, which has been fought over since the Treaty of Verdun. The only child of Charles the Bold was his daughter, Mary of Burgundy, and she was supposed to marry the heir to the French throne, Charles, which would, in theory, bring the Burgundian lands back into the French kingdom. Or, if you want to take a zoomed out perspective, it would bring Lotharingia back into Western Francia. Now the ruling council of the Burgundian Netherlands, the States General, didn't want her to do this because they were fearful of losing some of their privileges and some of their freedoms. So Mary promulgated the Great Privilege, a set of laws which returned the rights which Charles and Philip had taken from the free cities of the Netherlands. There were other candidates, but eventually, Maximilian I, a Habsburg, comes to Mary's attention and she weds him. So now, the House of Valois Burgundy and the Habsburgs were joined, seriously expanding Habsburg territory in this part of Europe. However, there were rebellions against this in the north of Mary's lands, and the French invaded in an attempt to take the territory, and thus the economic resources of Burgundy for themselves. The fighting continued for decades until the Treaty of Cambrai in 1529, when Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, renounced his claim on the Duchy of Burgundy, and Francis I, King of France, renounced his claim on the Netherlands. Now the French occupied the territories during the chaos of the Thirty Years' War, and this led to even more fighting over Burgundy, which would see the rise and fall of French hegemony over Western Europe and the former Carolingian Empire, culminating in the rise of Napoleon. Now with that said, however, this video has gone on for far too long, I think at this point it's about an hour, so I'm going to split the script in half. We'll end here, and we'll pick up next time with a great deal of military history and early modern warfare. So everyone, thank you very much as always for watching, I do hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you're looking forward to the next half.